Yep. Um, okay, so hi everybody. Uh, my name is Rachel Russell. Um, I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm a harm reduction specialist at the health department. Um, I've been there for about three years. Um, and apart from that, I've been involved in community-based harm reduction work in Philly um, for about the past eight years seven years? I don't know. Time is strange. Um, but um, basically, this training is going to go over kind of like um, some background information on um, opioids um, and the Philly drug supply generally, um, some data information about what the overdose crisis looks like here in Philly. And then the last section of the training will be um, about how to recognize and respond to um, an opioid-related overdose. Um, I do encourage folks, you know, some of this material can be triggering or definitely like difficult. Um, so if you need to take a break um, or you need to stop for the evening, I definitely encourage you to do whatever you need to do to take care of yourself. Um, like uh, Satori said, it's being recorded, so you'll have another chance to get the information if you'd like. Um, and it seems like there's not too many of us. So if you have a question, um, you can just unmute yourself and, and interrupt me. Um, if it's more of a comment, um, I would maybe suggest leaving that for the end. Um, and I'll try to monitor the chat, but it might be difficult for me. So again, if you just want to unmute yourself, I'm totally cool with that. Um, yeah, so I'll get started. Um, so again, background opioids um, are drugs that are used to control pain. Um, they are derived from the poppy plant. Um, so those come in like the pharmaceutical forms that a lot of us are familiar with, like Oxycontin, morphine, Percocet, Vicodin. Um, it's also in street drugs, things like heroin, fentanyl, um, pressed pills, and then also um, a part of uh, more prescription medicines used to control, uh, to manage um, opioid dependence, um, like methadone and suboxone. Um, so again, with medications that are used to treat opioid use disorder, um, there's buprenorphine, um, also known, sometimes people call it, um, bup, not done, but the brand name is suboxone, um, and it comes as a daily medication, um, as a film or tablet, and helps curb opioid cravings, um, there's methadone, which is a daily medication that can be taken um, as a pill or a liquid um, that most folks will have to be going to like a clinic daily um, or sometimes, you know, weekly or monthly um, to get their doses. Um, and that helps curb cravings and also manage withdrawal symptoms. And then um, there's also Vivitrol, which is a monthly injection. Um, it binds and blocks to opioid receptors, receptors to help reduce cravings. Um, it also comes um, in a daily pill, pill form, and that form is called naltrexone. Um, <clears throat> so here we're just kind of to distinguish between pharmaceutical drugs and drugs you find on the street. We have um, illicit opioids, um, heroin, in Philadelphia, we've historically um, had white uh, white powder heroin, um, but in the West Coast and the Southwest part of the United States, um, you're often more likely to see, um, you know, black tar or, or brown powder heroin. Um, some of that is becoming less typical um, as fentanyl has like become increasingly more common throughout the country. Um, and then, you know, illicit fentanyl, it's also similarly, usually like a white powder, um, but these are also just some images of it being popping up um, in counterfeit pills. Um, this has been increasingly more common in past, in recent years, um, and a lot of the pills are actually, like, there's a, the fake Xanax there is actually like a pretty poor one, I would say. Um, a lot of them are actually pretty good. Um, at mimicking them, if you didn't really know or you were like experimenting, you might have a really hard time distinguishing between um, a counterfeit pill and authentic pill. Um, the um, yeah, and so these ones, this example right here to the far, I believe the far right, um, it's the A215 pill is an example of um, one counterfeit pill that had fentanyl that um, was being sold for a while here in Philadelphia. Um, and just for you know your information, like. Sometimes you can kind of tell because there'll be like more of like a little pressed kind of outer circle around the ridge. Um, but again, that's sort of thing that is pretty hard to tell um, for, for a lot of people. Um, <clears throat> so this map here um, is obviously outdated, but we use it to kind of still just show um, overdose deaths in the country um, from 1999 to 2015. Um, 
just because a lot of times people will sometimes talk about the opioid crisis or overdose deaths rising and kind of out of nowhere. Um, and it has definitely been um, rising slowly and then quickly for a long time in the country. Um, you know, it just kind of started to get more attention um, with prescription opioids and when um, more privileged white suburban young uh, people started uh, being more impacted by the crisis. Um, this uh, map here um, shows uh, rates of drug overdose deaths um, by state in 2020. Um, I apologize, some of this data is still hasn't been updated with our 2021 numbers. Um, we are just waiting to get that from our EPI team. Um, but uh, as you can see, some of the highest rates are kind of in the, the Northeast, um, kind of in the Chicago, you know, Great Lakes area. And then you also see some in the Southwest. Um, and a, a lot of that is partly due because to um, like drug trafficking corridors. Um, the Northeast is a considered a major corridor as well as areas by the Great Lakes. And then obviously the Southwest um, with its proximity to um, Mexico and uh, South America as well. <laughs> In 2020, um, our overdose deaths nationally um, were around 91,795. 91, um, that number went up drastically in 2021 um, to 107,000 people that we lost to an overdose. Um, and uh, a lot of that, you know, has been was seen throughout the country, definitely here in Philly too. Um, and a lot of that can be tracked partly to like COVID um, and kind of a lot of the ongoing impacts that we're seeing um, from COVID on the country. Um, and then I guess just to kind of like give some context more um, about this historic nature of opioids in the country. Um, like I said earlier, a lot of times um, people will point to um, the rise in prescription opioids, which definitely plays um, a major role. But, um, you know, opioids have been around in this country for a very long time. Um, historically, they've been used to treat, um, you know, pain since the Civil War is morphine um, and were very commonplace household drugs, um, particularly for um, wealthy people, wealthy white women. Um, throughout uh, the late 1800s, early 1900s, and it was in the early 20th century that um, you know, we first started seeing um, these drugs scheduled as narcotics, as drugs that didn't have any um, medicinal value, um, which we obviously know is not true because they're still used for medicine now. Um, but, um, you know, and really when we started to see them outlawed, you know, again, that uh, basically like, uh, people who were then able to access these drugs either through their doctors or then having to buy on the street where before you could more easily get these drugs. And so um, then when um, prescription opioids like oxycodone um, and oxy Percocet became more popular, we saw prescription rates double from 2000 to 2012, um, you know, skyrocket at rates that we'd never seen because um, you know, they were marketed as not being um, able to build dependence upon, that they were safe. Um, and we know now, obviously, that that is not true. Um, but doctors were also like really encouraged at this time to look at pain as kind of um, considered like your other sense, that um, pain was something to be treated and paid attention to. And um, as we saw opioid uh, deaths rise with prescription opioids, um, those were kind of cracked down on the hardest. Um, we have like the prescription drug monitoring program now um, to really try and limit the amount of prescription opioids that people get, um, which is definitely good in many ways. Um, you know, there were definitely people who were getting like a 30 day supply of prescription opioids for like getting their wisdom teeth pulled, um, which is definitely like not necessary usually. Um, but with that, we also saw a lot of individuals who have chronic pain um, and, you know, were dependent on opioids um, kind of lose access to their prescriptions um, and a lot of the medication that they needed to kind of get through their everyday life. Um, and, you know, as the restrictions on prescribing 
um, lockdown, we did see um, a lot of prescription opioid uh, related deaths go down. Um, but we also saw then those numbers go up um, in other street drugs. Um, so kind of like to that point, um, particularly for someone who may have been using like a prescription opioid that kind of needed that medication um, to get through their day because they're dependent on it to manage their pain. Or even if someone, you know, was using um, recreationally or were more dependent um, or struggling with um, addiction, at a certain point, prescription opioids um, become, or street uh, sold opioids uh, become uh, just not an economical choice anymore. Um, usually now, if you wanted to buy a pill on the street, it'd be about $2 a milligram. So that could be $60 a pill. Um, obviously, that is very expensive and adds up quick. Um, so at a certain point, um, dope um, would be the cheaper option. And just to clarify for anyone who doesn't know, I'm just saying dope because um, we don't really have heroin anymore in Philadelphia. Um, and uh, it's mostly fentanyl in our supply and there's often um, other drugs mixed in there with it, um, such as a, a drug called xylazine that I'll talk more about later. Um, so dope is kind of just like a more appropriate catch-all term. Um, and, uh, but now, you know, if in Philadelphia, you can buy, um, you know, a bag of dope for $5, sometimes even for two or $3. And um, there's also free samples at times. Um, so it really ends up being uh, a more economical choice for people as opposed to trying to buy, um, you know, like perks or oxys on the street. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned, so, we don't really have um, heroin anymore in Philadelphia. Um, historically, we have, we as a city, we've been known as having some of the best heroin on the East Coast. Um, but since um, about 2017, our supply has pretty much been fully taken over by fentanyl. Um, if you're unfamiliar with fentanyl, um, it is a synthetic opioid um, made in a lab. Um, so it's a lot cheaper and easier to transport. Um, compared to heroin, which is derived from like the poppy plant and needs to be, um, you know, processed um, and uh, transported multiple times. Whereas fentanyl, because it's synthetic um, and it's so much more potent, it's about 30 to 50 times more potent than morphine. Um, <laughs> you can kind of get more for your buck in a very small amount. Um, so in the, the picture here, this is considered like the lethal doses um, for someone with no tolerance um, whatsoever to heroin or fentanyl. And as you can see, the amount for fentanyl is significantly smaller. Um, <clears throat> and um, that's why, you know, well, we'll talk more about that, but um, there are also over 150 fentanyl analogs um, that vary in potency um, and at times can be a hundred times stronger than fentanyl. In the example of car fentanyl, uh, we've seen carfentanil here a couple times in Philadelphia, but um, it was usually kind of like a one-off or so, and it hasn't been particularly common here. Um, the, the analog of fentanyl that we most commonly see here um, is pretty, pretty stable. It doesn't change a ton um, that we, we've seen in the past year or two. Um, so the rise of fentanyl related deaths in Pennsylvania. Um, so as these maps here kind of show in Pennsylvania, the uh, opioids involved in overdoses. Um, so as you can see in 2015, it's predominantly heroin in each county um, with prescription opioids um, more to the western part of the state and then some examples of fentanyl. But as you can see, by the time you get to 2017, fentanyl has really like taken over the whole state. Um, and that's definitely true to now. It is very difficult to find um, heroin here in Philly. Um, and part of this can kind of be explained by, you know, as we were seeing um, opioid involved deaths rise, um, our country's most common response to um, to drug related harm is to create more laws outlawing drugs, um, which may sound good to some, but um, can often create problems um, where 
essentially that drug just um, is replaced by a stronger and more potent drug. Um, this is kind of often referred to as the iron law of prohibition. So um, you can think about like alcohol use here in the United States. Um, when alcohol use was outlawed, um, that's when we started to see people uh, making more liquor and wine. Um, so beer was traded for more potent substance um, that you can more easily transport in a small amount. And that's kind of the same thing with the transition from heroin to fentanyl. Um, a much stronger drug in a smaller amount um, that you can more easily uh, move and also at a certain point in time was kind of uh, received less scrutiny or attention um, from the government and, and the DEA. Um, so looking at um, the rise of fentanyl related deaths in Philly. Um, so this is again a little outdated, it's 2010 to 2020. Um, and again, here you can kind of see over the years, um, pharmaceutical opioids um, has, you know, risen and fallen at times, but has uh, largely stayed kind of one of the lowest ones um, because we have had so much um, efforts made towards kind of controlling the flow of prescription opioids. Um, and you can see also fentanyl kind of like the other map showed around 27, like from 2015 to 2017 really surpassed all other drugs. Um, and just to just say real quickly, um, so this graph um, is any drug that was involved. It's not necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, so um, someone could have had multiple drugs in their system at the time of death. Um, and this is also based off of like toxicology reports, um, which just look at like what was in somebody's system at the time of death. Um, and it doesn't really necessarily tell you um, what drug it was that maybe caused their death. It just tells you um, what was in their system at the time of death. Um, one that isn't in here, you know, is like alcohol. Alcohol is a, a, you know, another drug that we don't often like talk about or think of as a drug in the same way, um, but also can definitely be involved in uh, these deaths and making, um, you know, complicating, you know, your death and putting you at higher risk uh, for an overdose or some sort of um, uh, effect from, from a drug. Um, <clears throat> so in 2020, um, we saw that fentanyl was present in 94% of overdose deaths um, that involved any opioid. Um, <clears throat> I think that, st that statistic is about the same for 2021, um, but uh, we did see um, a lot of uh, the our overdose deaths that involved stimulants went up in 2021, um, I believe by about 17% from 2020. Um, and so, you know, as we've seen that fentanyl is like a huge contributor to um, a rise in our overdose deaths, um, you know, being such a strong and potent drug um, and being involved in so many deaths, you know, they're rightfully so there's been a lot of fear um, around fentanyl um, and has kind of spurred a lot of myths about fentanyl. Um, a very common one um, is that you can overdose by touching fentanyl. Um, this has been particularly um, reported uh, by first responders and police um, in a lot of like news stories, but there has been a lot of, there's a lot of evidence to show that that is just impossible, that you cannot overdose from touching fentanyl. Um, it cannot be absorbed through the skin. Uh, pharmaceutical companies have spent lots of money making fentanyl patches. Um, you know, if you could just touch it and, um, absorb it, there would have been no need to do all that. Um, there's also um, another myth that fentanyl powder in the air could be inhaled and cause an overdose. Um, that is also not true. Um, I can't even conceive really of what, what amount of fentanyl it would take for that to happen, um, but um, just it being in the air is, is not going to affect you. Um, it doesn't like vaporize um, that in like that in a way that you could easily absorb it. And then another myth is that Narcan cannot reverse a fentanyl overdose, um, and but Narcan can reverse any opioid-related overdose, even fentanyl. Um, there are some instances where um, if it was a different fentanyl analog, maybe like carfentanyl, and it was extremely potent, 
um, that you might need more Narcan than usual, um, or it might take a little longer for the person to um, fully uh, regain consciousness, but Narcan will always work on any opioid. Um, and then, um, so just kind of to talk more about the drug supply here in Philadelphia, um, the health department in partnership with um, the lab CFSRE, which stands for Center for, I never remember, but their website is right there and you can love it, like go and check them out. Um, but they, um, they're wonderful. They've worked with us to test a lot of the drugs here in Philadelphia to help us get a better idea um, of what is actually in the drug supply before it's, um, you know, getting into somebody's system. Because like I said, a lot of the data we've had prior to this um, has been from uh, the medical examiner's office and toxicology reports. Um, and you can't necessarily tell what are it, what's in the drugs um, based on what someone is in someone's system at the time of death, because they could have taken multiple drugs. You don't ever really know what exactly someone took. Um, so in the time that we've been doing this since about September 22, I mean, 2020, uh, we've definitely tested more than this now already, probably about over 700 samples at this point. Um, and uh, in the dope supply, we've seen the fentanyl purity. Um, <clears throat> so purity meaning kind of how much, um, like a percentage um, of a specific sample or like a bag you have is actually that drug. Um, so in a bag, um, the fentanyl typically ranges from being 10 to 20% of the bag. Um, and we've seen xylazine um, range from about 20 to 40%. And I'm gonna explain more about xylazine in a few minutes. Um, but to the right, to the other side here, this image, we have an example um, of one stamp that here we're just calling stamp X, um, but it is one stamp that we've tested multiple times, um, you know, just over a couple month uh, period. And you can just kind of see how in that period, how the uh, fentanyl purity, the amount of that was in there, changed a lot. And then the potency, so potency is kind of like the, how strong the effects of that particular drug you expect it to be. Um, could really vary it sometimes going from, you know, one week in June to, you know, a week or two later in July being 10% to 21% and the potency being um, twice as much. Um, and another bag at the end of July, having xylazine be 45% of the bag. Um, so, you know, as we're kind of talking about fentanyl being a huge, a big part of like driving our rise in overdose deaths, um, we definitely also have to talk about variability in the drug supply playing a major role. Um, you know, people often tr try to take precautions by buying from someone they know, buying from the same person, buying, you know, the same bag on a regular basis. Um, but even when you're trying to do something like that and the, you know, the drug supply is changing so quickly from, you know, maybe one day you bought this and then the next day it was twice as strong. Um, it's really hard to know how much to use um, or how to kind of monitor your own intake when you don't really know what you're using. Um, and if you're interested in more of these reports, this website here has kind of like a quarterly report um, that we release um, regularly um, that goes over the samples that um, we've tested. Um, we do test things other than dope, but that's just what I shared here today, if you are interested in knowing more about that. Um, and then, so compared to um, the other top 10 uh, largest U.S. cities, again, this is a little um, outdated, but the data remains pretty much the same um, in terms of trends. Philadelphia has um, had the highest overdose death rate, um, even compared to like cities like Chicago. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, you can look at that partly as like being a part of the history of Philadelphia because it has historically been known to have, um, you know, such strong drugs. Um, it's been a place that people have flocked to to come and buy their drugs. Um, <clears throat> but also um, because fentanyl, took over, you know, kind of our state in terms of the dope supply so much faster than other places. This is definitely now changing across the country. Um, you know, a few years ago, we would have said, oh, well, like in California, you know, the overdoses, um, our rates are lower because, you know, people can still get um, 
heroin or they, you know, they can get heroin and they don't only have to get fentanyl. Um, or they might be able to buy kind of like, you know, a hybrid, but they're, they had more choice and ability to kind of choose what they were getting. Um, that's definitely changing um, more all the time. Um, and, you know, as fentanyl is increasing, like in the West Coast, they are also seeing their overdose numbers um, go up. Um, and, you know, just kind of saying like, with it being there, like there's definitely people who, you know, who may be using dope, um, you know, where fentanyl is kind of the only, only drug that they've, you know, ever used. They've maybe never used, actually used heroin. Um, and this isn't necessarily about preference or anything. You know, there are definitely people who wish that they could still find heroin, um, but it's just a matter of, um, you know, fentanyl is, is all that's available. And then also some people prefer, it, especially because it's all they've known. Um, it has, um, you know, it's much stronger. You know, if they used heroin now, honestly, it might not really, they might have to use way more um, or mon might not even like it because it wouldn't be as strong and it would be harder to um, kind of stave off with symptoms of withdrawal um, if they were to switch. Um, so in terms of putting kind of our overdose crisis in the context with other, um, you know, health epidemics and crises, um, <clears throat> in um, 2021, um, the number of Philadelphians we lost to an overdose was 1,276. Um, this was a 5% increase from 2020. Um, and you can see here kind of like the peak number of deaths that we had um, in the AIDS crisis. And here in Philadelphia was 935. Um, even, you know, with gun violence um, being, you know, so, so highly talked about and such, um, so highly impacting so many here in the city, um, we still are losing about three times as many individuals to an overdose. Um, pretty much the only health crisis that that outpaces overdoses here in the city at this point would be COVID-related deaths. Um, and then, um, so fatal overdoses are kind of only one part of the picture. Um, you know, fatal overdoses are kind of what we can keep track of, what we can know about. Um, uh, Non-fatal overdoses that were re reversed by Narcan um, are very hard for us to capture. Um, we often will never know how many lives are truly saved by the use of Narcan. Um, <clears throat> there are also, uh, you know, overdoses aside, there are lots of um, complications related to drug use um, that are harder to capture, um, like soft skin tissue infections, um, you know, new HIV infections, uh, hepatitis C infections, while we can all track those, um, you know, those are kind of a part of the whole picture still um, of when we're thinking about, um, you know, the impact of drug use um, and, and our policies as well. Um, <clears throat> but in terms of, you know, non-fatal overdoses, this is some information that just tracks overdose reversals that have been done by um, first responders um, like EMS, uh, police and SEPTA police um, who, who carry Narcan with them, um, which is, you know, super important. Um, I do also just like, you know, like to note the, that the, the true first responders though, um, you know, we often say in harm reduction are other people who use drugs. Um, like I see, we'll never be able to know how many people's lives have really been saved um, by other people who are in their community and their loved ones, um, you know, who are reversing people on a regular basis, um, you know, and people aren't going to the hospital. Sometimes people can overdose, the same person, you know, can overdose multiple times. Um, and all those things um, are really difficult for us to capture. Um, so this is kind of what I said. Um, we had 1,276 individuals um, lost to an overdose in 2021. Um, this was a 5% increase um, from 2020. Um, this increase that we did see in Philadelphia, you know, is slightly lower than um, we saw on average across the United States. Um, you know, but it's definitely, um, you know, still every single one of those people, someone whose family um, who will never will never be the same. Um, this graph here kind of breaks down in terms of, again, at the time of death, what was in someone's system. Um, 
and you know by stimulant with no opioid, opioid, no stimulant, opioid, and stimulant. Um, <clears throat> and from here, we can also really importantly understand that um, we can't really just like only talk about opioids because most individuals um, are poly substance users, are using multiple types of substances, um, including opioids and stimulants. Um, and this year, we've also seen um, stimulant involved, uh, 2021, we've also seen stimulant involved deaths um, go up significantly, I think, by like a 17% increase um, as well. Um, so kind of in that vein, you know, there Sorry, are other you, drugs. You probably just said that, but was, was that previous chart just Philly, right? Or like a Philly county? Yes, this or? is just Philadelphia. Oh, yeah. All of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Thanks. You're Thank welcome. You. Um, <clears throat> so other drugs that um, are on the rise in Philadelphia, xylazine um, is a major one. Um, xylazine has been, uh, is an animal tranquilizer. <clears throat> We've, uh, it's not approved for use uh, in humans. Um, there isn't a ton of research currently about its effects in humans, um, just because it's meant for animal use. Um, it's typically used with horses. Um, it was originally kind of seen to enter the, the drug supply in Puerto Rico. Um, and it has been found in Philadelphia um, at least since 2004, but there's been um, a significant increase um, between 2020 and now. Um, I believe in 2021, it was involved in 34% um, of overdose deaths. Um, and that was a significant increase from the, the previous year. Um, <clears throat> But part of um, what we're seeing is that it is a, um, as mixed in with the dope supply, um, and it's occasionally been found um, in other drugs. Um, it's hard to know whether that was like through contamination. Um, you know, if someone maybe accidentally, um, they had their drug in one bag and they were trying to like consolidate or something and put it into a different bag they already had. Um, because it's all, we've only seen it a few times um, in other drug supplies like cocaine or crack. Um, <clears throat> but it's also, um, it is a vasoconstrictor. Um, so it makes people's blood vessels um, constrict and it makes it more difficult for blood flow to kind of get to different um, extremities in the body. Um, and this is, we've been seeing has been leading to, um, you know, associations with severe wounds, um, kind of regardless of how someone uses whether they're injecting, smoking, or snorting, um, and also kind of regardless of their injection um, or drug use practices. Um, there has, you know, sometimes people have said it's because people are not injecting um, appropriately, like, you know, appropriately cleaning their skin and using sterile syringes. Um, but more and more um, at the levels that we're seeing it, it se seems to be um, a primary, a big part of the wounds that we are seeing. Um, it can give people wounds that kind of look like ulcers. Um, sometimes people describe them as looking like acid burns. It can lead to um, soft skin and tissue infections becoming necrotic very quickly um, and really slow down healing since the, the blood flow to the wound is really restricted um, while, while using xylazine. Um, and then chemically, it is similar to um, benzodiazepines. Um, <clears throat> It is a depressant on your central nervous system, um, and it can increase risk and complications with overdoses, which um, we'll talk a little more about when I um, go through how to recognize and reverse an overdose. Um, so as I said, um, you know, stimulant-involved deaths are also increasing in Philadelphia. <clears throat> um, again, this is showing, um, you know, cocaine. Uh, I think this number has gone up in 2021. Um, it, stimulants in 2021 were involved in 67% of all overdoses. Um, as I mentioned, that was a 17% increase. Um, and this is, uh, and it was seen to be increasing when it was with an opioid and when it was also not with an opioid. Um, so kind of just like stimulants being on the rise in general. Um, We've also seen uh, methamphetamine use um, really go up significantly, and that's partly because methamphetamine um, has been much more widely available in Philadelphia than it had been 
um, in previous years. Um, and the meth that we have found so far here in Philly um, is pretty pure and also um, pretty cheap. So um, it's often because of its availability and its cheap price, uh, more people have been have been starting to use it than before. Um, and then in terms of fentanyl, um, there have been a number of instances that um, you know have received a lot of press in terms of fentanyl contamination. Um, I'm sure if you ever watch the news, you've heard people talk about it. I, there was um, there was a lot of talk about fentanyl and candy this year at Halloween. Um, I would like to say that is not real, but um, we have had real instances of fentanyl contamination and other drug supplies, um, which just kind of stresses the importance of, um, you know, we need to be talking about the drug crisis in terms of people who use all types of drugs and in every which way that people use drugs, whether it's recreationally, um, every day, uh, dependent, you know, this is information that everyone needs to have. Um, the instances that we had here in Philadelphia um, were in 2018, and then again in 2020, um, instances where there was uh, fentanyl in the cocaine or crack, and there was also a time when there was it in the supply in K2. Um, and again, part of what makes this so dangerous is that especially when it's in other drug supplies, um, fentanyl is so potent in such small doses that if someone doesn't have a tolerance for it, um, it's very easy to overdose from it. And oftentimes, um, you know, people may be less prepared with something like Narcan or how to recognize it um, because they aren't expecting to have that effect from the drug. Um, and I do just want to say that we say, um, err on the side of saying fentanyl contamination, um, because we do think it is uh, accidental. Um, you know, it, economically, it doesn't really make sense to be intentionally trying to kill anyone who is buying your product. Um, and again, because it is so strong, like it can just be trace amounts in something. A lot of times, like if someone is packaging drugs and they're not cleaning their scales, they're not cleaning their workspaces, um, it's not that difficult for it to get into something, you know, one white powder into another white powder. Um, there is also, um, to kind of touch on the thing about fentanyl contamination or fentanyl and Halloween candy, or there was also a rainbow fentanyl thing that the DEA um, spread a lot about. Um, there is, that has been common, um, at least like colored fentanyl in Canada for quite some time. Um, and, you know, some people kind of, and we have started seeing more colored um, dope here in Philly in the past year or so. Um, and people really kind of point to that as, you know, partly being like a marketing thing to kind of like tell apart um, but also to kind of actually as a safety measure um, to try and keep um, drug supplies separate. So, you know, if you're coloring the fentanyl, then you won't mix it up with your white cocaine. And um, it's a way to kind of try and um, protect people, actually. Um, so. So in terms of fentanyl contamination, um, that is why we have... Um, encourage people to use fentanyl test strips. Um, so fentanyl test strips are actually um, urine drug screen strips, but they've been um, you know, repurposed by harm reduction um, groups and people who use drugs um, as a tool to kind of test actual drug residue and see if fentanyl is present um, and allow people to make an informed choice um, when, about what drug they would like to use and also take safety precautions. Um, the health department offers a training on how to use these. If you're interested, um, you can go to our website and register for that as well if you'd like to. Um, <clears throat> but if you're interested in getting your hands on some, you can request them through the health department, um, Prevention Point Philadelphia, um, as well as dancesafe.org. They're uh, a little pricey on dancesafe. Um, they're about, uh, I think they're like, they're more than a dollar a strip because that's how much we buy them for. And I know they sell them for a little more than that. Um, but Dance Safe also did recently come out with their own brand of fentanyl test strip, just kind of as a um, caveat. Um, it's different from the brand that, that we give out and provide instructions on um, as the health department. Um, the brand we use uh, comes in green packaging and they've got these blue ends. Um, whereas uh, Dance Safe's um, 
have like a yellow end um, and they have their own specific instructions for theirs. Um, and if you're interested in that, um, I can talk more about that at the end. Um, so <clears throat> again, you know, just like we need to be talking about um, all substances um, and people who use, you know, talking with people who use all types of drugs, um, it's really important to reach every part of the city here in Philadelphia. Um, every part of the city is affected. Um, every demographic of person is affected. Um, a lot of times there can be um, a large focus um, on the Kensington area as far as uh, the overdose crisis. And, you know, there is definitely, um, you know, a concentrated area of the crisis and often the most visible part of the crisis, but it definitely occurs in every part of the city. Um, <clears throat> and, he, you know, this again is out, a little bit outdated, but we have seen, we see, are seeing high rates of overdoses um, in the Northeast, Southwest parts of the city, um, you know, more Northwest um, and North Philly, as well as um, South Philly. It's, it's really everywhere. Um, <clears throat> And also, you know, as while it might be more uh, visible in Kensington, um, you know, partly due to kind of like history of like uh, divestment from the Kensington and Fairhill area, um, and you know, the the loss of other sort of economic opportunities in in that neighborhood, um, it definitely affects everywhere. Um, in the city as a whole, they about seventy percent of overdoses happen inside people's homes. Um, so you just aren't really seeing the, you know, the crisis, um, in other parts of the city as much. Um, <clears throat> and then, um, as far as there are significant, you know, racial disparities, um, in overdoses, um, for the first time during the COVID lockdown, um, we saw overdose, um, numbers in Philadelphia among non-Hispanic Black individuals, um, outnumber uh, <clears throat> uh, the overdoses among non-Hispanic whites. Um, and this trend has continued in 2021. And, um, you know, part of that, you know, can be explained by just ongoing, uh, you know, systemic racism um, and, you know, inequitable access to different treatment and resources. Um, <clears throat> I also think, you know, as a public health, we have to acknowledge our, um, you know, response to the overdose crisis um, and, you know, the war on drugs in general um, with the rise of opioids, which, you know, are more typically associated with white individuals. Um, we poured a lot of effort and resources into, um, you know, getting Narcan out and trying to address um, drug use in a kind of kinder um, way, recognizing it as a, as a public health issue, um, as opposed to um, a criminal issue, um, as we did with the crack epidemic. Um, and I think, you know, these trends that we see are, are continuations of, of that harm. Um, and in order to address that, you know, we have to continue to talk about that harm and, and make reparations for that. Um, <clears throat> And then just to kind of break down the, by type of drug, um, opioids um, among uh, Latinx individuals, non-Hispanic um, white individuals is primarily, um, <clears throat> opioids um, are definitely the highest. Um, <clears throat> and we've seen um, with opioid and stimulants, that's uh, also true for white individuals. Um, and then stimulant involved deaths, um, are generally considered the driver among non-Hispanic non -Hispanic Black individuals. Um, and in 2021, in terms of like changes in demographics, um, we did see a significant increase um, among uh, Black women in, in overdose deaths. Um, it was a 29% increase. Um, again, um, over, most overdoses occur in private residences. Um, approximately 70% occur in a house or apartment. Um, and then there are definitely neighborhoods um, where that is even higher. Um, this map here kind of breaks it down. Um, certain neighborhoods um, are suppressed, though, if the overdose counts are, are not high enough. Um, and um, yeah, even in Kensington, the Kensington 19134, 
um, neighborhood, you know, still 70% of overdoses are actually happening inside people's homes. Um, so now we're going to go into the um, reversal uh, Narcan uh, bleh, the Narcan training part of this. Um, does anyone have any questions about any of the data stuff before I move forward? Nope. Okay. Um, so we're going to go over kind of recognizing and responding to an overdose. We'll go over what puts someone at risk for an overdose, um, signs of an overdose, how to use Narcan and aftercare. Um, <clears throat> Just to kind of say, we've already touched on this a little bit, drug use happens on a continuum. Um, this can range from experimental and recreational use um, all the way through, um, you know, dependence. People have lots of different reasons um, why they use drugs, and there's, um, you know, all different sorts of settings um, in which people use them. Um, but no matter kind of who you are um, and what setting you might be using, um, or even just, you know, as a person existing in the city of Philadelphia with one of the highest overdose rates, um, I would say it's important for anyone to, to know um, how to use Narcan and how to recognize an overdose. Um, so what puts people at risk? Um, mixing drugs. Um, so particularly, um, you know, mixing any type of drug can be, can be risky at times, but especially if you're um, mixing uh, other multiple types of depressants. So using like alcohol and benzos, benzos and opioids, um, all these things that um, are kind of like layering depressant effects on your central nervous system can increase um, your risk of overdosing. As we talked about earlier, variation um, in the strength and content of your drugs. Um, and this is a big one, uh, you know, that we often see whenever there's a, a kind of surge or an uptick in overdoses. And it's usually because, um, you know, there was one bag that went out that was twice as strong as it normally is. Um, your mode of administration, whether you're, you're eating, smoking, or injecting your drugs, snorting your drugs, um, you know, injection posing just kind of the highest risk just because of how quickly it affects the body um, and gets to the brain. Um, <clears throat> previous overdose, um, there's some evidence that having overdosed before can put you at an increased risk of overdosing again. Tolerance changes, um, as I mentioned before, fentanyl um, has an extremely short half-life, um, so its effects can wear off pretty quickly. Um, and um, your, so that means, you know, your tolerance can go down as very quickly and then as little as 24 to 48 hours without use. Um, <clears throat> so this often affects, you know, individuals, if you, if you went away for the holidays, maybe, and you spent time with your family and you didn't use for a while, um, if you were in the hospital or if, you know, maybe you got locked up overnight, um, or, you know, any of those sorts of things, any sort of reasons why someone might not, um, just in a really short amount of time, you could use the same amount you normally use and it would you could potentially overdose just because your tolerance went down. Um, using a loan, um, that one's just obvious because there would be no one there to, to respond to potentially overdosing. Um, and then other physical health things. Um, so like your liver functioning, um, any weight loss, um, anything with your that might be going on with your immune system, um, COVID, uh, even like dehydration can put you at increased risk um, or any sort of like breathing conditions, asthma, um, things like that. Um, again, so some of these, you know, still don't apply, kind of apply right now, but, um, you know, we can also think about it in terms of just, you know, how our, um, our overdoses have, have gone up since, uh, you know, nationally and really throughout the world since the COVID um, pandemic. Um, you know, physical distancing. Um, again, if you're alone, harder to have someone nearby to respond to an overdose. Um, decreased access to services. Um, you know, harder with COVID, it's, it was harder for people to get access to healthcare. Um, you know, recovery. There were a lot of people who, you know, years in recovery, um, their recovery supports were interrupted by COVID, and it caused them um, to return to use. Um, you know, being able to get meals, uh, sterile supplies. Um, even having a safe place to sleep, you know, being rested kind of functions, it uh, factors in with your body functioning. Um, and, you, you know, some of this that definitely still applies, you know, if you think about like 
the the rise of like mental health conditions, um, you know, really across the country and how difficult it is to get access services right now. Um, I have tried to help people make therapy appointments and they've so many places that don't even have wait lists anymore. Um, <clears throat> impaired breathing, um, you know, so there's um, some evidence that, you know, particularly unhoused people who use drugs, um, you know, may have weaker immune systems or breathing problems, um, which can increase your risk of severe COVID. Um, and then also COVID, you know, affects your breathing and your immune system long-term, um, which can um, increase, you know, all the effects or complications that can come up with using um, different types of drugs. And then again, time without use, um, you know, if individuals were in recovery and returned to use, um, it's always an extremely period time of like high risk when people are released from jails, hospitals, other facilities, um, again, because they have a, a lower tolerance. Um, so in terms of a progression of an opioid overdose, um, so an opioid overdose can kind of happen right when someone uses, or it can take um, a while progress, you know, like an hour into when someone uses. Um, so first, you know, someone's breathing is suppressed, um, their respiratory rate will start to slow. Um, as it slows, their brain starts, you know, is not getting enough oxygen. Um, if you go long enough without enough oxygen, um, your heart stops, um, and then that will lead to, to someone dying. Um, so a big part of responding to an overdose that is very important is distinguishing the difference between someone being high and someone actually overdosing. Um, if someone is just high and not overdosing, you do not want to Narcan them. Um, they will not thank you. They will probably be very frustrated um, <clears throat> because people spend a lot of time, money, and effort um, you know, to achieve a certain feeling that they want, to avoid withdrawal. Um, and we, when you do Narcan someone, um, it does can put them into um, withdrawal pretty immediately. Um, as I said, people spend a lot of time, money, and effort to avoid that feeling. Um, you know, with withdrawal comes like sweating, fevers, chills, aches, diarrhea, vomiting, um, a lot of like horrible, awful feelings. Um, <clears throat> so when someone is high, um, they will usually have, you know, like relaxed muscles. You might see someone kind of slumping, um, bent over, um, looks like, you know, may look like they're falling asleep, standing up. Um, someone also might just be sleeping. Um, they'll have normal skin tone though. Um, it's possible that they might have slowed or slurred speech, appear drowsy, um, but most importantly, like they should be breathing. Um, Ideally, they should be responsive to stimuli. That one can be a little more difficult with xylazine in the supply, um, but I'll talk about that more in a minute, um, and uh, a normal heartbeat. Um, when someone is overdosing, um, they will be unresponsive or unconscious. They'll have shallow or no detectable breathing. Um, their skin, I usually, this is kind of like one of the primary ones I look for. Also just, you know, like trying, if you're like, out and about, I'll kind of stop and try to see if I can see someone's chest like rising and falling. Um, but then I'll usually look at their fingertips and lips. Um, if someone is white, like myself, they'll usually, um, they might be very pale, but they'll also usually have like bluish or purple um, fingertips um, or lips. Um, if someone is black or is in darker skinned, um, they may have um, a kind of more like gray ashy um, color to their fingertips or lips. Um, you it might also hear like snoring or gurgling. Um, sometimes, you know, people will think that their loved one is sleeping um, because, you know, they're snoring. Um, that could be a sign that like they're actually not getting enough oxygen. Um, so if you hear that, you definitely want to check on someone to try and determine if it is someone like actually just snoring or, um, or a sign that they're not getting enough oxygen. Um, vomiting, slow or regular heartbeat. Um, I feel like this one we see less now, but it, we did see for a while when kind of fentanyl first was starting to be in the supply a lot. Sometimes people would have very stiffened body postures um, or like seizure-like activity. Um, that I def we definitely see that less now, I feel like. Um, and then, or, you know, sometimes like strange behavior prior to becoming unconscious. Um, 
that one is obviously kind of hard to to know what that means but i think the key part is becoming then becoming unconscious um can i just ask um is it good to look at the fingers underneath the fingernails to see if it's pale or pink yeah i mean i just you know i just kind of look at the finger you I, either one you want to pay attention just kind of like fingertips i'd say this whole this whole area you want to pay attention to thank you um um so as i mentioned earlier like xylazine is um been in the supply a lot lately and it can definitely complicate um recognizing and responding to overdoses um it has a very strong um sedative effect um so sometimes what we'll be seeing is that um people will be breathing but will be like unresponsive like no matter what you can't seem to get a response from them and that is because like the xylazine is such a heavy sedative um <clears throat> or you know sometimes people will have overdosed and someone will give them narcan and they will you know it can take a long time for them to maybe start breathing on their own um or they will start breathing on their own but might not wake up and um it's again just because like Xylazine isn't an opioid, so it doesn't respond to Narcan, um, and it is uh, so heavily uh, sedating. Um, so one tool that we recommend, um, you know, if you are you know dealing with this a lot, um, if you have a loved one, um, is to get a pulse ox. Um, you can get them, I think now, CVS or Amazon, like they became way cheaper. Well, I don't know, actually, they were cheaper and then they were more expensive, but um, you can usually get them for 10 to $20 at like CVS or Amazon. Um, they're kind of, you know, like an at-home use tool um, to kind of determine someone's blood oxygen level. Um, if uh, you are fancy, you could get like a Fitbit or an Apple Watch. They do that too now, I'm pretty sure. Um, but um, they can help you determine if someone's actually overdosing. So your normal oxygen blood level should be um, above 96%. Um, and then if, you know, you use this, um, you want to, um, if it were between 80 and 95%, that's when you'd want to check for other signs of overdose. Um, so the things that we just went over, like the fingertips, lips, breathing, snoring, um, all that stuff. Um, but if it was below 88%, um, that's, I would give Nar Narcan and call 911. Um, so just in terms of how you use it, it's very simple. You just put it, um, you know, kind of like on someone's finger, just kind of like the picture shows, um, you calluses can affect, um, how good it is at reading it. So I recommend putting it on, um, you know, like your ring finger or pinky finger, um, nail polish and like, um, acrylics or gels can also affect its ability to read, um, accurately. So, if someone has nail polish or something on, if they have one nail that maybe doesn't, has like most of it chipped off or something, I put it on that finger. Um, and um, they are, uh, there are is studies that show that they are less accurate when used um, on individuals who are black. Um, so in those cases, they usually tend to err um, where they'll show that the number is a little bit um, higher than it actually is. Um, so I would say if you are monitoring someone who's black or has darker colored skin um, and they're in that kind of 88 to 95% range, um, I would definitely kind of like be a lot more attentive, checking for those other signs, seeing if you can get a response from them, those sorts of things, just because um, they are not um, as good at detecting um, just based on, I mean, well, medical racism and also just like how they work, the uh, melanin in people's skin interferes with like how the light works. I don't know, I'm not a scientist, but that's basically how it works. Um, so for Narcan, um, in terms of how it works in the brain, um, so naloxone is just the generic name for Narcan. Um, it temporarily reverses the effects of an opioid overdose. So basically, um, you know, we have a nasal spray is what um, we teach people how to use most commonly. There um, is an injectable form as well, but basically it enters um, the body, it goes to the brain and knocks um, the opioids off the mu receptors in your brain and binds to them for a short period of time. Um, <clears throat> it only works for about 20 to 90 minutes, um, which is very important um, to remember just because it is possible that once it wears off, someone could overdose again. Um, 
And it only works um, if someone actually has an opioid in their body. Um, so um, if you say you came across someone and you weren't sure what type of medical emergency they were having, um, you know, you could give them Narcan if there wasn't any opioid in their system. Um, it's not going to do anything to them. Um, I don't have any opioids in my system. I could spray it in my nose right now and nothing would happen. I could just continue talking with you. Um, <clears throat> um, one other just important note is that it doesn't flush the system. Um, like I said, it's just a temporary thing where it knocks, um, you know, the receptors off the brain. So, you know, in that time period, hopefully your body is like metabolizing, like what is already in your system. Um, but depending, you know, how strong what you took is, how much you took. Um, that's why when it wears off, you could potentially overdose again. Um, so types of naloxone, um, Narcan, the nasal um, spray, um, it works just like, um, you know, a normal nasal spray. It comes kind of like in a box, it's blurring this, but it comes in a box like this. It has two doses. Um, they're ready to go. Um, you just like tear off the foil on the back. Um, and this is what it looks like. I'm going to try to unblur my background so it'll stop blurring it. Um, doo -doo -doo, so it just look like this, and you just kind of push the plunger all the way to the top. Um, there is um, recently a generic version of this, um, which I believe is a little cheaper. Um, the public interest price for Narcan, um, which we get as the health department, um, is about $45 for two doses, which is actually um, a big decrease um, that happened in the past year. It used to be $75 for two doses. Um, so it has gone down in price quite a bit. Um, and there is now a generic version um, that was recently approved. But I'm not sure how much that one costs. Um, <clears throat> there's also um, this atomizer version. Um, the this is often what like EMS will use. Um, they'll just connect it to a syringe um, and inject it um, intramuscularly usually. But um, there is this generic version. It's usually a little cheaper at your pharmacy if you wanted to get it. it comes with this um, little thing that you screw on the top here, um, and then you can just kind of press it similar to like a, a the spray like this, um, and it uh, atomize um, atomizes it and allows you to use it as a spray as well. Um, there are also, we took out the one about an auto injector. Um, they didn't make those and now they're making them again. Um, the new auto injectors that they have um, are like um, an IM injection. They kind of look like something like this, where it like talks to you and kind of walks you through how to use it. Um, the That new auto injector, um, I can't remember what it's called. I think it starts with a Z. It like just came out the other week, but um, it is a very high dose of um, naloxone. Um, I honestly like wouldn't really recommend anyone to use it unless it's the only thing they had, um, just because it is um, when naloxone is given intramuscularly, it, um, it works much faster um, than the nasal spray because um, it has more like uh, bioavailability in the body. Um, but the auto injector that they just came out with um, is much stronger. It's much more likely to put someone into withdrawal. Um, it's just more than you'll usually need um, to reverse an overdose. Um, <laughs> so the first step um, in responding to an overdose um, is usually just to kind of check on someone. So um, if I'm, you know, walking around or if I'm with someone, um, I'll usually, if I kind of see like someone is really out of it, um, I usually just will kind of first stop and see if I can see them breathing. If I see like their chest rising, it falling at what seems like, you know, a normal rate, um, you know, I'll be like, that person's probably just asleep. They're fine. Um, if I'm not really sure, if I can't really see if their chest is rising and falling at a normal rate, um, <clears throat> I will usually kind of like get a little closer, yell like, hey, are you okay? Um, try to get a verbal response from them. If um, I do that twice and someone doesn't respond to me, then I'll usually kind of try like touching them, you know, like shaking their shoulder, maybe like, you know, kicking their foot, depending on who they are to you, how comfortable you feel. Um, uh, you know, you can decide how close or how, you know, personal to be with touching someone. Um, if they still don't respond to that, 
um, then you want to do something to try to um, apply a little pressure or pain um, to try and get a response from them. Uh, some of the methods that are commonly used. One is a sternum rub that's kind of shown there. You make your hand a fist like this and you take your knuckles um, and you rub kind of like right in the middle where you can like feel um, you know, your breastbone. Um, if you try it on yourself, it's not comfortable. Um, uh, and again, you, know, you just wanna do it just hard enough to cause some discomfort. Um, a sternum rub you know, doesn't do anything to actually reverse an overdose and you can hurt someone if you do it too hard or too aggressively for too long. Um, other ones that I'm usually more comfortable doing, um, just because that can be a pretty intimate way to touch someone you don't know, um, is, you know, you can do like a finger bed nail press where you can just kind of press where your skin meets your nail. Um, if you press, try it on yourself. It's not very comfortable. Um, if you have like a hair tie, you can kind of like snap someone with a hair tie. Um, just like anything that's a, a little bit painful to try and get a response. Um, if you do all of those things um, and someone still doesn't respond, um, <laughs> then um, I usually say, um, if you don't respond to me, I'm going to give you Narcan. And I say Narcan very loudly because a lot of the times, even if you have not gotten a response to any of those other things, um, people will hear the word Narcan and will respond to you if they can. Um, and again, that is because um, being narcan when you don't want to can be very unpleasant. Um, you know, a lot of people spend time, money, effort um, to feel a certain way. Um, and also uh, people often wake up in withdrawal <clears throat> when they um, are given Narcan. Um, so, which is, can be very unpleasant. Um, <clears throat> sometimes, you know, sometimes people have conversations where they think that this part is not very important. Um, but I would say that, um, you know, emergency situations can be very disempowering to someone. Um, and, you know, if someone, you know, the standing order that we have that allows people to carry Narcan, use Narcan, um, is with the idea that, like, someone is unconscious and unable to give consent to it. Um, so, you know, you want to try to empower people, keep in mind what people want for themselves, um, and not just give Narcan to anybody because you see that they're high. We want to make sure that it's being used for people who actually need it. Um, you know, also I mentioned it's very expensive, so we do not want to waste it. Um, <clears throat> so again, if you do all those things, you say, uh, um, if you don't respond, I'm going to give you Narcan. I'll usually say that twice. I'll say Narcan very loudly. You don't respond. Um, and then I will give them Narcan. Um, that might sound like a lot of steps, which can be hard in like an emergency situation, but they will go quicker than it sounds when I'm explaining it. Um, so again, um, if you've decided that you're kind of like at the point where you need to give Narcan, um, I usually prefer to give the Narcan first and then call 911. Um, ideally, if there is multiple people there, um, one person can give the Narcan and one person can be calling 911. Um, you just want to kind of try and make sure you give someone Narcan as soon as possible, just because during that time, that is time that their brain is not receiving enough oxygen, um, and that can lead to, you know, permanent um, brain damage, harm to the body. Um, so we want to make sure that we get that to them so that they can start breathing as soon as possible. Um, when you do call 911, um, you want to give your exact location. Um, I will usually describe symptoms. Um, people in Philadelphia have very differing responses as to whether saying someone is overdosing improves or decreases response time from emergency medical services. And also depending on where you are, that can definitely actually have a very real impact on how quickly someone responds, unfortunately, because of stigma. Um, so I will usually just say someone is not breathing, someone's unresponsive um, when um, I call 911. Um, also, just as an important safety note for yourself, um, if you are um, ever checking on someone and they um, are injecting, just make sure that, um, you know, kind of look really quickly around you to see if there are any syringes nearby so that you can kind of like kick them out of your way. Um, you know, if you have some space, um, I would only kick them if you have a closed toed shoe, otherwise just try and stay away. Um, if someone does have a syringe, um, you know, in their arm or something um, or somewhere in, in their body, um, I would just leave it there for the time being unless, um, you know, you're really, it's less like truly in your way, but um, I would leave it there for the time being. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of giving um, the naloxone, like I said, you've decided to do it. 
Um, I would do this first, give the Narcan, and then hopefully you or someone else is calling 911. Um, your 911 call can be a really great way to try and keep track of the time. Um, Cause I don't know about you, but I would never remember to like set a stopwatch to keep track of time. Um, because um, if you do need to give an additional dose, you wanna be sure to wait um, like three to five minutes before giving the second dose. Um, <clears throat> just because it does take a little bit of time to work um, and you don't wanna give, you wanna avoid trying to give anyone more Narcan than they actually need because again, more Narcan, if you're giving people multiple doses, that's going to increase the, the risk of them waking up um, in pretty bad withdrawal. Um, and again, the Narcan works for 20 to 90 minutes. Um, so I'm just gonna, I'll go through this and then I'll show on the mannequin, um, which will be a little bit difficult to see just because I'm in my house and this is not the best setup. But um, once you give um, Narcan, um, ideally you would wanna give rescue breaths. I know, um, especially with COVID and just in general, um, everyone's comfort level around this um, will be different. Um, <clears throat> But um, we give out like Narcan kits and we always try to include like face shields in them, um, you know, try and increase people's comfort to do um, rescue breaths um, because it is, you know, in the meantime, while you're waiting for the Narcan to work, um, or even if let's say you didn't have Narcan available, um, that's going to allow some oxygen to get to their brain um, and will buy you time until Narcan or medical services um, can arrive. Um, so you'll basically, um, you know, You've given the Narcan, you've called 911. Um, you want to kind of, if the person isn't already in a position, you want to kind of lay them back in some sort of way so that you can work on them. Um, you want to kind of check their airway. Um, again, our kits come with gloves. Um, you can you know, just open their mouth. You want to just, um, you know, if there's anything in there, just kind of brush it out um, just so that their airway is fully open. You uh, tilt their head back, lift their chin. You're going to pinch their nose and give two quick breaths. Um, I'm just going to uh, well, stop sharing real fast just to kind of show you all better with the mannequin. Um, so if you came across someone, um, this is the Narcan, like I said, it's one dose and it's ready to go. Um, you don't have to like pinch nostrils or anything. You just want to put it um, right up the person's nostril kind of all the way, this person, this mannequin's nostrils are small, but you know, you wanna put it up more in a normal person. Um, and then you just push the plunger all the way to the top. Then this dose is done. You can just throw it away whenever. Um, so again, you're kind of tilting the head back, you're checking the airway. I don't have gloves right now, but pretend I have gloves. Um, you just wanna kind of like clear their airway. These um, are the face shield that we have. You can kind of see they have like a face outlined on them. Um, and you just want to kind of line it up with the person's face. So you're going to tilt their head back, you're going to pinch the nostrils, and you're going to do two quick breaths and then one breath every five seconds. So this and then, and then one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi, and then one. And then you keep doing that until you start seeing them breathe on their own. Um, definitely want to like unpinch their nostrils in between breaths. Sometimes people forget that um, because you want them to be able to breathe. Um, but you want to keep doing um, those breaths until someone starts breathing on their own. Um, I'm back to sharing my screen. Um, you don't want to give chest compressions um, unless their heart has stopped beating. Um, and um, You'll kind of know if the Narcan and the rescue breaths um, are working. Um, if you do see someone kind of like take a big breath and they start breathing on their own, um, other signs that you'll want to look for is um, their um, coloring will start to improve. Um, you know, their lips, fingertips, you're going to start seeing them go back to like a more regular color. Um, Again, these are kind of different like barrier methods that one could use um, for rescue breaths. Um, in our kits, you know, we have face shields. Um, so a lot of people carry around Ambu bags. Um, that's, you know, not necessarily the easiest thing for the most average person to have, um, but that's also a, a really good way to make sure that you're doing rescue breaths without putting yourself at any risk, um, you know, for any sort of mouth to mouth, um, uh, you know, illnesses or anything, respiratory illnesses. 
Um, <laughs> let's say though, if you weren't comfortable doing with rescue breaths, um, you didn't have an Ambu bag um, or you know an oxygen tank, an oxygen tank would be great, but if you, nobody really has those. Um, you just wanna put someone um, in the recovery position instead. Um, so here's kind of the, the recovery position. Um, so if you, you know, gave them Narcan, you didn't want to do rescue rests, you put them in the recovery position, you're waiting for, you know, two, three um, minutes to see if they, you know, they're starting to get better on their own. If you have a pulse ox, ideally you've got like a pulse ox on their finger and you'll, you know, see that their blood oxygen level is going up or not going up. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, if they're not improving at all um, within three to five minutes, then you would want to give a second dose of Narcan. Um, most people would say you do, usually don't want to give more than two doses, kind of like out in the field of Narcan, um, um, just because you're, again, so it's very highly likely that they're going to be um, in major withdrawal when they wake up. Um, and usually they're going to require more medical attention. Um, <laughs> You know, people can get a little, you know, it's a very scary thing. Um, and sometimes people can go a little overboard, give people like five doses of Narcan within like five minutes and the person wakes up like projectile vomiting. Um, so that's, you know, just kind of why we want to be careful about how much we're giving to someone. Um, but if you, you know, you gave the Narcan, um, you did the rescue breaths, they're starting to breathe on their own. You know, you're seeing like their blood oxygen level go up on the pulse ox. You're seeing um, uh, their color come back to normal, um, but maybe they're not yet conscious. That's also, you want to put them in this recovery position. Um, you know, same thing you're taught with like alcohol poisoning or if someone drinks too much alcohol, it's just, you know, to kind of, your airway is a little bit more open when you're on your side. And also if anyone were um, to throw up, um, it just makes sure that someone doesn't, you know, choke or anything like that. Um, so after overdose, um, an important thing, you know, to kind of note, um, when people do overdose, um, people are usually like, when they first wake up, they will not know that they overdosed. Um, you know, in people's mind, they were just high, they were asleep, you know, they did not know um, that they were overdosing. Um, so a lot of times if, you know, someone is starting to wake up, um, you know, a lot of times they, you know, people might be crowding around them. Um, you know, it can be very disorienting. So I really encourage people, you know, to kind of like give people space when they're first waking up, make sure that there aren't a ton of people around someone, um, you know, trying to be like gentle and warm with someone. I will usually kind of say, um, Hey, you know, like I, I came across you, I gave you Narcan kind of like explain what happened. You weren't breathing. Um, and, um, you know, I will try to avoid say like you were overdosing. I just kind of say you weren't breathing um, and I gave you Narcan. Um, another thing, you know, so as we mentioned, Narcan is only works um, temporarily. Um, so when someone is kind of like, you know, fully conscious, you know, they're probably still disoriented. Um, but if you're able to, um, you know, ideally EMS arrives and, you know, they'll go with them and be monitored, but there are lots of valid reasons why someone might not feel comfortable going with EMS or might not even want to wait around for EMS to arrive, um, you know, because of stigma, um, people are often mistreated, um, when they are picked up by, uh, first responders, when they do go to hospitals, um, you know, people have medical trauma, like there are lots of reasons why someone might not feel comfortable going with or waiting for um, first responders. So if that happens and you're, you know, in that instance, you're still there, um, <laughs> you do want to try to encourage people um, not to use for at least two hours um, <clears throat> because of the, the Narcan. Um, again, like if someone does wake up with withdrawal, kind of like their first instinct might be to use again, just because they are feeling crappy. Um, and they want that to go away, but because the Narcan is in their system, um, it's going to be, you know, a waste of money and drugs because for at least, you know, the next hour, 90 minutes, one, they're not going to feel anything. They're still just going to be in withdrawal and feel crappy. Um, and then also, you know, depending on how much they use, um, how strong what they're using is, it is very possible that they could, if they use again, that could put them at even higher risk of overdosing again, once the Narcan wears off. Um, so it's really important to kind of encourage people 
um, to wait to use again. And also, um, you know, if someone isn't comfortable going with EMS, um, do try to encourage people um, if they can be with someone that they trust um, or if they can be in a public place just so that there's someone around to kind of like keep an eye on them in case um, they do overdose again. Sometimes, um, you know, a lot of the kits we give out um, come with two doses. Um, you know, sometimes I'll like leave the other, if I only used one dose, I'll leave the other dose with them um, so that it's there, you know, in case, in case they do overdose again. Um, even if someone's just walking by, there'll be Narcan there for them to respond. Um, overdose aftercare. Um, so obviously responding to an overdose can be very scary, very traumatizing, whether it's, you know, a loved one in your life or a complete stranger. Um, it's still like a very intense experience. Um, and, you know, if it's a loved one, it can also bring up a whole host of other things, you know, that you might, you might be dealing with in your relationship. Um, so um, one resource just that I like is nextdistro.org slash OD aftercare um, kind of has some tips on, on how as a responder to an overdose to kind of take care of yourself um, and maybe also how to talk to your loved one um, who did overdose and kind of about how to support them while also taking care of yourself and, and having your own boundaries. Um, I think it's really well written, so I would recommend it for read. Um, in terms of getting Narcan for yourself, um, PA standing order is a prescription for any PA resident. So you can go to any pharmacy um, in the, and get naloxone without a doctor's prescription. Um, it is covered uh, by most insurance plans. Um, and the standing order also provides immunity for people um, who report and or respond to an overdose um, so that you, you know, won't get in trouble. I will say in, you know, Philadelphia, that pretty much is always true. If you go outside of Philadelphia, I can't always, you know, I can't make any promises about what it's like outside of Philadelphia. Um, you know, it is the law. So the way as laws go, it can, you know, protect you if anything were to go beyond into court, but can't always protect you from how, um, you know, police or other law enforcement enforcement might treat you in the moment. Um, <clears throat> Also, just kind of as a note, um, sometimes people do get pushed back. I would say more particularly at like small, like local pharmacies um, that they need a prescription um, in order to get Narcan, um, that you might have to do a little advocating for yourself in that moment. Um, you can just, if you have the phone, you can pull up the PA standing order and show it to them. But I can assure you, you do not need a prescription from your doctor in order to get it. Um, <clears throat> these are just some, a couple pharmacies in Philly, um, that we know have always had, you know, have a good relationship with and are good at giving, getting people Narcan. Um, sorry, you wanted me to go back to which, to the URL? Is that the aftercare one? I'm hoping that's the one. If not, you can ask me at the end and we'll, we'll go back to it. Okay, cool. Um, uh, there is also um, a copay assistance now uh, program in Philadelphia. Um, if you um, want to find it, you can just Google like PA um, naloxone copay assistance um, and then you can print out like a little, I can also send a, put a link in the chat um, once I'm done with the slides um, and I'll print out like a little coupon looking thing for you. Um, you most, you don't need the coupon, but you, if you want it just to kind of has, have as a thing to show your, the pharmacist, um, that can be helpful, um, but it'll cover any copay up to $75. Um, the amount of insurance coverage for Narcan really varies based on insurance. Um, most met all the Medicaid providers fully cover it, um, but if you have private insurance, um, it can really range um, as far as how much is covered. So um, if you are uninsured or if your copayment is very high, um, you can always get it from Prevention Point here in Philadelphia. Um, or Next Distro is another great resource um, that we're partnered with, um, along with Soul Collective, which is a community-based harm reduction group here in Philly. And they work together to mail people free Narcan and fentanyl test strips. Um, all you have to do is go to that website, nextdistro.org slash Philly, um, and it's delivered right to your door in discreet packaging. No one can tell what's in it. Don't need insurance, no money, nothing. <coughs> And then um, just some kind of like overdose prevention strategies beyond Narcan. Um, you know, 
we it had we do have to definitely talk about things other than just Narcan. Um, we have more Narcan in the world, um, in our city than ever before, and our overdoses, um, you know, are still going up. So it is definitely not, um, it can't be our only focus or solution. So some other ways that, um, you know, individuals at least um, can try and help keep the, themselves safe and their community safe. Um, if you can test your drugs with fentanyl test strips before using them, um, if you can kind of like try to ask around before you buy, um, you know, see how others who have maybe already used that day, use that supply or feeling. Um, you know, look at your drug and try to see if it appears or feels different than normal. Obviously, like, you know, you can't like really tell what's in a drug by looking at it, but um, it's just kind of like, you know, a way to kind of assess on your own, like, does this look different than it normally does? Maybe it does. And therefore I should use a little less today to make sure, you know, to have a better sense of how I'm going to feel. Um, or maybe I'm going to make sure today that someone else is around um, just in case. Um, and then again, just like starting small and going slow, you know, you can always use more, but you can never use less. Um, so, and then um, there are a couple um, other resources if you, um, someone is using alone, which um, will, you know, always happen that is sometimes people's preferred way of using substances. Sometimes that's the safest way for them to use substances. Um, <clears throat> So if that's up, that is what someone's choosing to do, um, you can encourage them to use the Never Use Alone hotline. Um, the number is right there. You call um, and you're connected to kind of like a trained um, volunteer um, who will kind of stay on the phone with you while you're using. And if you become unresponsive, um, they will call um, 911 for you. For you. Um, the Be Safe Community app is like a similar um, <coughs> A similar premise. Premise. Um, it was designed uh, by people who use drugs for people who use drugs, um, and it has um, a text and phone-based option. Um, and it's an app you can download. And they um, also allow people to kind of create their own safety plan. So maybe someone doesn't want to nine one one to be called if they overdose. You could, the people can program it so that you know the person to be contacted is like their best friend or their mom or whoever um, they feel safest having contacted. Um, and then um, they also have this really neat thing called the Brave sensor, um, which I think, you know, like makes sense. It's a sensor that basically you can put like, let's say like in a bathroom or someone's room. Um, and if after like a certain period of time, there's no movement of any kind, it, um, it will send an alarm um, to someone else who is kind of like a, a special little like call button thing um, to go check on the person, um, which is pretty cool. Um, and then... I'm only going to talk about this for a second because I could talk about it as a whole other training, um, but some policy approaches um, that can help reduce harms associated with drug use, um, you know, are like decriminalization of drugs, um, you know, partly of how we talked, I uh, talked about how criminalization of drugs is partly what leads to these stronger and more potent substances popping up in our supply. Um, safe supply is one, um, and all these methods have been used in other countries, um, other parts of the world. Um, safe supply um, is, a, is a model where people are given prescription grade drugs for them to use so that they can know exactly what they're using um, and how much um, they want to use. Um, you know, this exists in Canada and other places in Europe. Um, safe consumption sites or overdose prevention sites, they have many names at this point. Um, you know, there was Safe House that tried to open in Philly. Um, and then there is one called On Point um, in New York City currently, um, but they also operate um, in Canada and Europe and, you know, are basically meant to be a place where people can be monitored um, and connected to other services as well, um, you know, to help ensure people's health and that they don't overdose when they're using. And drug checking programs um, are another method that are gaining traction in the United States and have existed for a long time. Um, in Europe as well, in Canada. Um, and basically the idea is to allow people to check their drugs either, you know, before they use them hopefully, but also maybe after someone uses something um, so people can have a better idea of what they're using um, and kind of what precaution safety measures they can take to have um, you know, the best experience and best possible outcomes. Philly Harm Reduction Services, um, Prevention Point, um, Angels in Motion, it doesn't exist a ton anymore, actually, so I should need to remove that. But 
Um, Prevention Point is offers, you know, the syringe exchange program, a bunch of um, health services, um, community services, drop-in um, center for people. Um, and then there's also Soul Collective, Operation My Backyard, Project Safe, um, are also all community-based harm reduction groups. Um, if you're interested in kind of getting more involved in that work um, or learning more about it, um, if you're interested in generally learning more about harm reduction and drug use, um, these are some great resources. Um, National Harm Reduction Coalition, um, Filter is a, um, a journalist uh, news site um, that offers kind of like harm reduction centered reporting um, on drugs and drug policy. Um, and then Narcotica and Crackdown are two, two podcasts if you're a podcast person. Um, yeah, um, if you have um, any questions or if you want to get Narcan fentanyl test strips, if you want to do a Narcan fentanyl test strip training, um, you can reach out to myself. My email's right here. Um, Charlie is my coworker. He's great. You can reach out to him too. Um, and our website um, has a bunch of resources that we talked about here as well. Um, yeah, does anybody have any questions? I have questions. Um, thanks so much. This was really fascinating. Um, I didn't know most of this stuff, so it was really great. Um, I um, I'm interested in like like mushrooms and pot, and are they ever um, mixed up with fentanyl? Um, so there have been like a lot of I would say like news stories about uh, fentanyl contamination in weed, and sometimes people you know just like colloquially talking about um, fentanyl contamination in weed. Um, we have, with our drug checking program, we have like tested weed and we, we have not a lot of samples to be fair, but like some samples, you know, throughout the city, um, and have, have not found any evidence of like fentanyl contamination. Um, a lot of the, you know, every time there's like a news report about something like that, um, we usually like try to look into it and connect with whatever jurisdiction said that it happened, um, or other like drug checking programs that we have ties with in the, throughout the country. Um, and it usually has always ended up being like some mishap along the way of like, uh, mishandling of substances, um, or mixing of substances on the part of like people collecting, um, the, the drugs. Um, I think like, um, a lot of the times, like, people will say like, oh, my, my family member just smoked weed. Like that's the only drug they did. There must've been fentanyl in the weed. And I think it's that in those situations, you really have to think about stigma and like the fact that like a lot of people are like not going to be comfortable sharing like every drug that they use. Like it's a lot less stigmatizing to say that you use weed compared to being like, oh, I also take pills. Um, so I think that plays like a huge part in it. And then also just like, sometimes I think like a lot of people are not used to how strong weed is now. Um, you know, like people are, especially like a lot of people who used to like smoke weed like 20, 30 years ago and now are just smoking weed again. Like you can't get mids like anymore. So like the weed is just so strong. Like sometimes people are like, oh, I thought I was, you know, like, like we'll describe things of like them overdosing on weed um, and like say it was fentanyl. And, and sometimes you have to be like, well, if that were true, you would, you wouldn't be here right now. Like you would have died. Um, so like, I think just like kind of education also like around like how weed is really different now um, because like we have so much more like medicinal marijuana, like more people are able to get their hands on that. So um, it's just so much more powerful. So I think that also plays like a big role. And then um, I think you said mushrooms also. Um, I, have I have not ever heard any stories of like fentanyl contamination with mushrooms. I don't know if you have, but I have not heard of that. Thank you so much. This mm -hmm. is so interesting. Thanks, Rachel. Um, I, I've been keeping an eye on the chat and I don't see any other lingering questions that you haven't answered. Um, so I guess, you know, this would be the time for, if anyone else has any questions, you can feel free to either unmute yourself or if you feel more comfortable putting in the chat, you can do so. Um, and I'm sure, you know, Rachel will answer any other, any other questions and then we'll kind of wrap up. So just wanted to say thank you, Rachel, again, for everything. It was very important. Yeah, no problem. And then I'm just putting in the chat, the like coupon for the copay assistance. In case thank you. I appreciate that. And, um, afterwards I'll 
see if I can, you know, get all of the, the resources and all the contact information from Rachel, and I can send that to you guys with the recording of this training as well for anyone, you know, who's interested in some of those resources. And I'll, um, I'll Rachel, if you're okay with it, I'll put your, your email address, you know, in there as well with the contact info, just in case if anybody wanted to reach out to you for any other questions. Yeah, of course. Yeah, thank you so much. It was a, a great presentation. So very informative. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Um, yeah, so after the Narcan wears off, um, it is possible like that the, the person could become high again, um, and, um, potentially overdose again, but that's also just like only an opioid. So like if someone had used, um, you know, cocaine and fentanyl, um, and, you know, they overdosed and you gave them Narcan, like it would have no effect on like the cocaine in their system. A quick question. Is it just the, the police officers and the SEPTA employees and everybody that has access to it? Or are there, I know, like I live across the street from a CVS. Could I walk in, let's say, you know, to a CVS and say, I see somebody on the street, somebody needs help. Can I, can I get an Arcan that way? Or do you have to, you know, be uh, one of these uh, responders, first responders? Yeah, so the, the Pennsylvania standing order allows any individual to have and carry Narcan. Um, and protects people um, in terms of like liability, like administering Narcan. Um, so yes, you could go to any pharmacy, um, emergency or non-emergency situation um, and ask for Narcan without a prescription. Um, and, and they legally are supposed to give it to you. Sometimes, um, you know, pharmacists will just like not be informed, um, you know, about the standing order or maybe because of um, stigma may not feel like they want to give it to people, but um, that's, you know, kind of what I mean when like some self-advocating might come into play. Um, if you just Google, um, you know, like PA standing order, like you can show it to someone and be like, yes, you legally, like I am allowed to get this. Um, just to add to your response, Rachel, there's also, I believe it's still there. Um, they recently, I believe in the past year or so, outside of Blackwell Library in West Philadelphia, I believe there's a Narcan kiosk that people can still get that from. Is that so accurate? Yes. Um, yeah. So that is another option. It's outside um, on 52nd Street in front of the Blackwell Library. Um, we um, regularly monitor that. Um, we'll say that we've had some technical difficulties with it in the past month or so, um, but um, it is supposed to be working right now. <laughs> and also, oh, sorry, I just wanted to add one more thing. Just for the relevance of, you know, MRC volunteers out in the field, um, if you guys are ever deployed to, let's say, any type of clinic or anything involving a, you know, potential medical attention that may be given to, to patients or um, folks out in the community, we typically do carry Narcan with us. Um, our team always has it on hand, um, especially when we serve at-risk populations or if we're going out into Kensington or, you know, doing certain deployments like that, um, just, just for everyone's awareness. If you know you are deploying with us, PDPH will typically have it on hand. So just ask whoever your MRC point of contact um, that day. Um, you know, if we happen to have it, but nine times out of ten we will. Um, and then um, in terms of nar excuse me, um, Narcan working after its expiration date. Um, so like technically it says it um, it works for three years, but there's like lots of research that shows it works um, and lasts like much longer than that. Um, some studies have shown up to like 10 or more years. Um, there are also sometimes th things about like heat and cold sensitivity. Um, I would say like even in high temperatures, it's also been shown not to really degrade too much. Um, like, and if it does, it, it slightly lowers the potency, like the same with like, as it goes on further past the expiration date, like the potency might go down a tiny bit, but like, honestly, especially if you have like the nasal Narcan, I would argue that's not like, also not even like the worst thing because like this, it's just so much Narcan that like, um, like this is like 10 times as much as what someone gets from like an intramuscular dose, which is kind of like the original way that Narcan or naloxone um, existed and was given to people. Um, so, and that's partly because it's less bioavailability in a nasal form, but 
um, it's still often like a lot more than people need and which is partly why people wake up in such bad withdrawal. So like, I honestly wouldn't even say that's a terrible thing. Um, but yes, so like um, it works past the expiration date. Um, it works even if it's been in your car and it's really hot. Like I'd say for as far as cold temperatures, um, the only thing I'd be really worried about if it were to be like actually frozen. Um, and then, um, what was I going to say? Oh, if you do ever have expired Narcan, never throw it away. Um, if you, if that makes you anxious and you'd rather get some new Narcan, you can always, um, email us at the health department. You can email myself personally, um, or you can just go to our website, um, to get our information, um, and we'll exchange it with you for, um, a new dose and we'll get that older dose out into the community somewhere where we know it'll be used more quickly. Um, and then do libraries still hand out Narcan? Um, so sometimes we have like events at libraries. Um, the libraries don't, some, there are libraries that keep it on hand to give it out when people ask, um, or in case of an emergency, but, um, I wouldn't say on, in general, like the libraries are not just like handing it out. Um, but there are a couple, like McPherson library keeps it on hand for anyone who asks for it. Um, there is like the Narcan Tower outside of the Blackwell Library on 52nd Street. Um, and I believe every library does have at least like, you know, two kits there um, for in case of an emergency at the library. Um, and then, so, so Narcan, yeah, it only works on opioid drugs. So that's like heroin, fentanyl, Herx, Oxys, um, anything that, that is an opioid. And unfortunately, doesn't work on anything else. Um, yeah, there is no requirement to alert authorities if Narcan is administered. Um, there are probably a lot of, you know, there are a lot of people who would not want you to alert authorities um, if given Narcan. Um, you know, one thing I'll say, if you, you do call 911 in Philadelphia, you are first automatically, you are first talking to the police. Um, which can be stressful for some folks, understandably. Um, and that is also partly why some people might make the decision to just say that someone is unresponsive or not breathing, as opposed to saying someone is overdosing. Um, but we do have the Good Samaritan law. Um, so, you know, like legally, um, there are, you are protected for, you know, responding to someone who's having a health emergency, calling 911, um, you know, even if they do send police like you are not um, at risk of, you know, legally at least, of being in trouble for anything for responding. Um, you know, sometimes there, obviously, if you are someone who's Black or Latinx, you know, that might be a situation where you might feel less comfortable. Um, and there are instances, especially outside of Philadelphia, um, where people, um, you know, have tried to report someone overdosing, police have came, and they got, like, drug homicide charges because they were like doing drugs with their friend. Um, those don't happen a ton, but they do happen um, particularly in other parts of the country. Sounds like you've saved a lot of people's lives. Um, I mean, I've some. <laughs> Fantastic. You're a hero. You're a hero to me. And, you know, spreading this information to people is absolutely so incredible. It's, it's beautiful. And I appreciate you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thanks I, for doing I that. threw away two doses of Narcan. Um, oh a few months ago because they were five years old. Mm -hmm. I had no idea that I could keep it that long or that you would replace it. Yeah. So now, now I know. Now you know. Share, <laughs> share the word. <laughs> I'll only have to buy it one more time and then I can get it replaced. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how can we get this um, recording? So I will send the recording out to everyone um, probably sometime tomorrow. 
Um, I'm going to post it on our Philadelphia MRC YouTube page so you can have um, continuous access to it. But I'll send everyone an email with the link as well tomorrow. And can we like post it on Facebook? Yeah, you're always welcome to share the word. Um, I honestly highlight any training that we do also on our LinkedIn page. Um, so if you're on LinkedIn, feel free to connect with us. You can repost them there. Um, you're welcome to, you know, encourage people, you know, to visit the, the YouTube page to, to view the training. Um, if you're interested, you know, please, I'll send out a feedback survey after this training, probably again tomorrow, um, you know, to just get you guys your, some feedback about this. I can share that with Rachel. And then if you would like the other training that she mentioned, you know, please let me know. I'm sure that'll be something that her and I can um, set up for you all. Since, you know, this is such a success, you know, everyone seemed to really enjoy this. So thank you again, Rachel. But yeah, this is something um, that you guys would like us to kind of build on and, and offer the, um, the fit and old testing strip training. Just, just let me know and I'll, I'll do what I can to set that up. Um, so, you know, Rachel, is there anything else you'd like to say to everybody? Um, there's just a lot of, you know, thank yous and great, <laughs> great presentations in the chat. So, you know, you really did a great job. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for being engaged. It's always nice when people have questions and are interested makes it makes my job easier and better <laughs> um and story if you could just share um at the end like you just an email even like how many people attended the training that would yeah, be great course. cool yep no problem all right. all right everyone um thank you again and have a great evening thanks have a great night everybody thanks you too bye